decade prior in 1774, Louis XVI was crowned King of France and inherited a country with significant financial crises. Rising inequality, the aftermath of the World War and the Seven Years' War, and the revolutionary fervor of America slowly filtering into French culture along with Enlightenment era philosophy. France also was an extremely unequal country, where the clergy and aristocrats, representing just 1.6% of the population, had complete political and economic control through hereditary power. Socialist Jean Girard described the economic subjection, It was not one action in rural life that did not require the peasants to pay a ransom. The feudal rights thus extended their clutches over every force of nature, everything that grew, moved, breathed even over the fire burning in the oven to bake the peasants' poor bread. The urban population of laborers and artisans also experienced economic and political subjugation. The apprenticeship system was all but dismantled by the state, and day laborers had had day permits to exist in the cities they work in. The rural police would use this to harass the working class, arrest them, and send them to beggar colonies. In 1787, King Louis XVI called the Assembly of Notables for the first time in over a century. It was a council of high-ranking aristocrats to help deal with the economic crisis. Any proposals to remove the aggressive taxes on the poor, create taxes for the aristocracy or clergy, were denied. The harvest of 1788 was destroyed by droughts and storms, and the economic situation for the king became desperate. It allowed for the summoning of the Estates General in May 1789, a sign of the monarchy being an extremely weakened state. And the estate general was comprised of three estates of groups, nobility, clergy, and the rest of France. The last time it was convened was 1614, however it was quickly apparent radical reform would not happen from this model. So the third estate, the majority of the French people, formed the National Assembly. Its purpose was to write the French constitution. King Louis had to bow down to the pressures of the National Assembly which renamed itself the National Constituent Assembly on July 9, 1789. Jacques Necker, the finance minister, who was partially sympathetic to the Third Estate, was banished by the king on July 11th. The next day, the news hit the streets of Paris. The people feared a conservative backlash towards the assembly next, and took to the streets. Mass protests and riots broke out seemingly overnight all over the country. Conflict broke out between the military under King Louis and the poorly armed masses. The people would eventually raid repin and food depots, leading to a couple of days of combat in the streets of Paris. All of this leading to the famed storming of the Bastille on July 14, 1789, the ceremonial start of the French Revolution. In just the next few months, the feudal system would be utterly destroyed. The Declaration of the Rights of Man was written by Abbe Sayez, Marquis de Lafayette, and Thomas Jefferson, surprisingly and the Women's March would change the capital of France from Versailles to Paris. The feudal system that had controlled France for hundreds of years would be stripped away and abolished. The laws and courts were all abolished. It's impossible not to understate the societal shift happening here. While the economic and political power of the 13 colonies stayed largely intact after the American Revolution, the economic and political order in France was being completely rewritten. The Declaration of the Rights of Man would state, Men are born and remain free and equal in rights. The goal of any political association is the conservation of the natural and imperceptible rights of man. These rights are liberty, property, safety, and resistance against oppression. At 17 articles detailing the rights of citizens and the limitations of government, the U.S. Bill of Rights, which was written the same year, would only have 10 amendments. Criticism on the ambiguity of women's rights and the abolition of slavery divided right-wing revolutionaries and more radical groups. The aforementioned Women's March and the writing of the Declaration of the Rights of Women and the Female Citizen by Olympia de Gauge would decry the failure of the revolution when it came to women's rights. As the revolution was completely changed in the social and political and economic paradigm of France, civil factions started to take shape. In the assembly, the right-wing was led by Jacques-Antoine-Marie de Cazier, who opposed the revolution. The Munachians, or Royalists, led by Jacques Necker, wanted a constitutional monarchy similar to Britain. The Jacobins split into two groups, and then the people's movement separate from the assembly was the Sonculottes. The Sonculottes were a radical, lower-class, decentralized group that took direct action in the streets comparative to the bourgeois assembly. A growing cultural group more than an organized political group like the Jacobins, they wanted to establish local, direct democracy 
which would ensure the consistent price for necessities. They are the most radical in their politics compared to even the classical radicals, the Jacobins. The Jacobin Club was a relatively small group of Enlightenment-era nobles and middle-class bourgeois philosophers. It grew out of the States General in 1789 in secret meetings. The two figures that would dominate this new political group were the Count de Maribou and the infamous Maximilien Robespierre. They represented two sides of the Jacobins, the Girardins and the Montagnards. The French constitution was written in 1791 by the assembly, the majority of which wanted a constitutional monarchy and a new legislative assembly to replace the national assembly. The king still had veto power and could appoint ministers. Over the course of the next year in 1792, France's new constitutional monarchy would utterly fail under its own bourgeois ineptitude and wars with Austria and Prussia. The king would ultimately try to use foreign powers to reverse the effects of the revolution, leading to the sans culottes to gather a group of 20,000 Parisians, armed with mainly pikes, to march on the king's Tuileries palace. They would kill the Swiss guards and capture King Louis XVI. The sans culottes would go into the prisons and kill up to 1,500 prisoners, mainly Catholic priests and nobles believed to be conspiring with the royalists. This would be the moment where the revolution rejected the royalists and even moderates in favor of the radical ring of the Jacobins, led by Robespierre. A national convention was called where the centrist Girardons lost ground to the center-left Montagnards. The monarchy was abolished and a republic was declared. The reaction of the outside world of this growing revolution in France was best contrasted between Irish conservative statesman Edmund Burke and British American revolutionary Thomas Paine. In 1790, Burke would publish Reflections on the Revolution in France, denouncing the revolution as a destructive force and defended the monarchy there. He perceived the revolution as tearing the fabric of society. Burke, who was devoutly religious, also vehemently defended the power of the church over society. Burke predicted through the chaos of the revolution a popular general would take power, one of the few predictions he got right. Thomas Paine was fascinated with the French Revolution, and like Jefferson, felt a revolutionary kinship with the movement. He would write The Rights of Man in two parts in reaction to Burke, and also be involved with the National Assembly. Combining his work Grand Justice in 1795, Paine would lay out the blueprint for the modern social democratic philosophy we see in FDR and Bernie Sanders 100-200 years later. He would lay out programs for land and wealth redistribution, a universal one-time capital grant for both men and women when they reach the age of maturity, similar to a universal basic income except it's not annual, just a one-time capital grant. He also was the creator of the U.S. Social Security program, well over a century before it was actually implemented. He also had the notion that all people must pay a 10% tax on all personal and private property in a way to deal with the hoarding of wealth while giving an argument for ownership of the means of production half a century before Karl Marx. Thomas Paine stated, Personal property is the effect of society, and it is as impossible for an individual to acquire personal property without the aid of society as it is for him to make land originally. Separate an individual from society and give him an island or a continent to possess, and he cannot acquire personal property. He cannot be rich. So inseparable are the means connected with the end in all cases that where the former do not exist, the latter cannot be obtained. All accumulation, therefore, of personal property beyond what a man's own hands produce is derived to him by living in society, and he owes on every principle of justice, of gratitude, and of civilization a part of that accumulation back again to society from whence the whole came. If we examine the case minutely, it will be found that the accumulation of personal property is, in many instances, the effect of paying too little for the labor that produced it, the consequence of which is that the working hand perishes in old age and the employer abounds in affluence. This was revolutionary and again would be arguments that were echoed later on by Karl Marx and other well-known Marxist, communist, socialists, and the like. Paine would lay the philosophical bedrock of the entire modern socialist movement with this understanding of the exploitation of labor and the pre-Keynesian welfare programs. Back in France in the aftermath of the sans culotte imprisoning the king and queen and the war, 
declared between France, Prussia, and Austria, leading to the first in a constant continental wars that wouldn't stop until the fall of Napoleon in 1815. The newly appointed National Convention would give rise to the Committee of Public Safety, headed by Maximilien Robespierre. It would be Robespierre's speech in front of the National Convention that would lead to the execution of the former king and queen. Louis was a king, and our republic is established. The critical question concerning you must be decided by these words alone. Louis was dethroned by his crimes. Louis denounced the French people as rebels. He appealed to chains, to the armies of tyrants who are his brothers. The victory of the people established that Louis alone was a rebel. Louis cannot, therefore, be judged. He already is judged. He is condemned. Or the Republic cannot be absolved. To propose to have a trial of King Louis, in whatever manner one may, is to retrogress to royal despotism and constitutionality. It is a counter-revolutionary idea because it places the revolution itself in litigation. In effect, if Louis may still be given a trial, he may be absolved and innocent. What am I to say? He is presumed to be so until he is judged. But if Louis is absolved, he may be presumed innocent. What becomes of the revolution? If Louis is innocent, all the defenders of liberty become slanderers. Yes, the death penalty is, in general, crime, unjustifiable by the indestructible principles of nature, except in cases protecting the safety of individuals or the society altogether. Ordinary misdemeanors have never threatened public safety because society may always protect itself by other means, making those culpable powerless to harm it. But for a king dethroned in the bosom of a revolution, which is as yet cemented only by laws, a king whose name attracts the scourge of war upon a troubled nation. Neither prison nor exile can render his existence inconsequential to public happiness. This cruel exception to the ordinary laws avowed by justice can be imputed only to the nature of his crimes. With regret, I pronounce this fatal truth. Louis must die so that the nation may live. On January 17th, 1793, King Louis would be executed by guillotine for, quote, conspiracy against the public liberty and the general safety. Former Queen Marie Antoinette would be executed some months later in October for bankrupting the national treasury, conspiracy with foreign and domestic enemies, and high treason for intelligence activities with foreign empires. Within this time and the next year would be the Reign of Terror, where Robespierre were to consolidate the power of the Committee of Public Safety and systematically eliminate all counter-revolutionary forces. Even the Girardin faction of the Jacobin Club were executed. Robespierre would consolidate even more power after the assassination of his friend and fellow Jacobin, Jean-Paul Marat. Public records of the time say that over 16,000 people were executed. Now what to make of this violent period, which is still debated in academia? The internal and external dangers to the revolution were real. There were known conspiracies to roll back the revolution by people within the Jacobin Club and other reactionary and right-wing groups within the revolution. The external danger of the European monarchies combining their respective strength to fight the Revolutionary Republic was legitimate. The French Republic was already in the middle of wars with Austria and Prussia, while the British and Spanish empires were actively engaged in proxy wars in the colonies to strip away the French Empire. The threat of restoration of the monarchy was always present throughout the already five years of the revolution. Also, when talking about the violence of the oppressed, it must be framed with the violence of the oppressors. The absolute monarchy of France and the feudal system of serfdom did exponentially more damage and caused more death than Robespierre. The millions that were dying in the Napoleonic Wars that followed Robespierre obviously did more damage and killed more people than Robespierre. The revolutionary wrote in 1794, If the spring of popular government in times of peace is virtue, the springs of popular government and revolution are at once virtue and terror. Virtue without which terror is fatal, terror without which virtue is powerless. Terror is nothing other than justice, prompt, severe, inflexible. It is therefore an emanation of virtue. It is not so much a special principle as it is a consequence of the general principle of democracy applied to our country's most urgent needs.
It has been said that terror is the principle of despotic government. Does your government therefore resemble despotism? Yes, as the sword that gleams in the hand of the heroes of liberty resembles that which the henchmen of tyranny are armed. Let the despot govern by terror his brutalized subjects. He is right as a despot. Subdue by terror the enemies of liberty, and be right as founders of the republic. The government of the revolution is liberty's despotism against tyranny. Is force made only to protect crime? And is the thunderbolt not destined to strike the head of the proud? Indulgence for the royalists, cry certain men. Mercy for the villains, no. Mercy for the innocent. Mercy for the weak. Mercy for the unfortunate. Mercy for humanity. Karl Marx, just 50 years later, would write, There's only one way in which the murderous death agonies of the old society and the bloody birth rows of the new society can be shorn, simplified, and be concentrated. And that way is revolutionary terror. Though, as writer Jonah Walter states, quote, One more thing seems nearly certain. Sending political opponents within the ranks of the revolutionaries to the guillotine, the Dantonist, the Herbatists, was a reflection of political weakness that left Robespierre isolated and ultimately defenseless against the plots he so feared. No matter the morality of the revolutionary violence, this specific period would make Robespierre and his faction of the Jacobins alone in this world, where the enemies of the revolution were gaining power and coalescing. On January 27, 1794, the right and center of what was left of the National Convention would conspire to overthrow the power of Robespierre and the Committee of Public Safety. Robespierre and most of his followers would be arrested and executed by the guillotine. The White Terror, as it's called, would lead to the systemic executions of the radicals of the revolution. Proto-anarchist Gracchus Babeuf would try to restart the radical revolution with the conspiracy of equals, where he wanted direct democracy and the abolition of private property. He would be executed as well. All the radicals of the French Revolution would be stamped out during this period. A center-left bourgeois government called the French Directory would be formed from 1795 to 1799. By all accounts, it was a failure, and Napoleon Bonaparte would carry out a coup d'etat and replace it with the French consulate, and eventually crown himself Emperor of France. In effect, the French Revolution was over, and the Napoleonic era began. This ultimately led to the Bourbon Restoration that instilled a constitutional monarchy. Nonetheless, many changes from the Revolution and Napoleon, societal, political, and economical changes, could not be reversed.